It's good to be up here. It's a good night, right? It's a good night. I just, I just feel there's victory in the room, man. This is, like Paul said, this is special. There's victory in the room. There's new beginning in the room, man. There's redemption in the room tonight. There's, there's the reality of, G, of what Jesus paid for in the room tonight. Can you feel it? It's real. I, I, when I was in that pool, I was like, wow, we really believe this. This is real. None of us need to be here. None of us have to be here. No one's on any order to be here. You've chosen to be here because you believe that this is true. You believe that Jesus really did change your life. And this is such an honor for me just to be up here sharing the word of God to you priests, to you leaders, to you incredible sons and daughters. There is no one in the room more powerful than the other one. We all have Christ in us. Amen. And you know what? I, I, I just feel like we've been, we've been digging for the last couple of weeks talking about what Jesus has saved us from and tonight and in future weeks we're just going to keep talking about it and keep digging into what Jesus has saved us for because this story is amazing and it just keeps getting better every time I get into the word and prepare to share it with you guys I'm like it just keeps getting better I'm on the same topic that I've been on since I got up here the first time and I will be till I'm an old man and this beard is gray because it's the same story and it just keeps getting better because I'm feeling more and more freedom in my life, man. I'm feeling more and more empowerment to be the man that I was called to be. I lived a lot of my life with chains around my ankles and a lot of my life with a chain around my throat. I couldn't speak. I've been insecure. I've been afraid. I've fallen into ways that aren't free, and I know there's people in the room who feel the same. And so last week, we just dug deep into what it means to be baptized because we have to understand this is a gospel of transformation, not just transaction. You didn't just get saved to stand up on an elevator to slowly take you to heaven one day. You got saved, which means everything about you is new, and now eternal life has begun, so everything around you is beginning to change. That's the gospel, and that's why it's such good news, amen? 1 John 3, 9. Actually, do you know what? I, just, I got this scripture that came to me when I got up here that I haven't really ever preached on before, but it's, it's just such a beautiful one. Before I share that one, I've got to say it. John 8, chapter 8, verse 36, Jesus looks at his disciples, and he says, who the Son sets free is free indeed. Thanks, darling. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. Not dualistically free. Not a son on a Sunday and then a slave on a Monday. Not a saint on a Tuesday and then a sinner on a Wednesday. Who the Son sets free is holistically and irrevocably free. You are free. And so tonight we're going to dig deeper into that. I was just reminded of the scripture, 1 John 3 verse 9. And this is powerful. John's writing and he says, those who are born of God no longer make a practice out of sinning. Because God's seed is within them. God's seed is within them. God's seed. God's son is within you. God's son is within you. Jesus. Oh, snap. Baptism. <laughs> Stage just got baptized. Um, I'm going to clean it up afterwards. I'm too excited to preach. Oh, <laughs> uh, you're free. <laughs> Who the Son says free is free indeed. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Either that's true or it's not true, man. It's not dualistically partly true. It either is completely true or it's not true. And so last week we're, we're digging into Romans 5 and 6. Do you remember? I know it's been a week, but we were digging into Romans 5 and 6, and we were talking about the law, this mirror that God gave man at point, a point in history, and this mirror came down before men as written words, this Mosaic code, the Levitical law, and this mirror showed man the dirt upon his face. See, the law, the law was an invitation for man to live a holy and blameless life by the standards that God set, not that we set. And so we quickly found out that we couldn't do it. It was impossible. So the mirror only revealed the muck upon our face. And we tried to clean the muck on our face with the mirror that revealed it. But the mirror was only meant to reveal the fact that we needed something else, someone else to clean our face. So Jesus came. We learned about this last week. Jesus came, the new mirror. Not only did he wipe your face clean, but he gave you a new reflection of yourself. 
He gave you a new image of yourself. Jesus not only redefines the true image of God, every false image of God finds its definitive end in Jesus, but every false image of you finds its definitive end in Jesus as well. Well, That's good news because he that knew no sin became your sin so that you could become the righteousness of God. See, the law is about distance. The law is there to show you how far you are from God how distant you are from God. And we had to experience that as mankind to realize that we needed someone to bridge the gap, someone to live a holy and blameless life that we were never capable of. Law brings distance, and the devil only speaks with the language of law because his agenda is to keep you distant. Why? Because Jesus never does anything outside of relationship. Jesus never does anything outside of intimacy. God, in his very definition, is relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They've been together since the beginning. There was, even, there was no beginning for them. They've just always been there loving one another, in relationship with one another, in this uncorrupted, undestructed circle of love. So Jesus never does anything differently with us. He invites us into intimacy, into relationship, and then he starts moving. He starts moving within us. So the devil's primary agenda is to remind you of law, is to remind you of distance. If he can remind you of the distance, if he can speak to you about distance, he will distract you. He'll distract you of the love that Jesus has for you, the love that came and conquered all of your fears, He will distract you from living in the fullness of what Jesus paid for you. And the law, you can just rephrase it very easily. Independence. The law is is man's DIY project to save himself. It's man's project to prove himself worthy of God's love. And I don't know about you, but often in my life, I'm back there. I'm not going to lie. I was back there last week and I preached on it. And I had to go back to this. I started trying to do it for myself. I found myself in a cycle of once again trying to prove myself, trying to have the answers. There's people in this room that are still struggling with things, certain things. I know you are because I know that I am. And you have a choice. DIY, do it yourself. Or like Joel said, tap out, man, and let Jesus back in into his rightful place. Jesus is the bridge, amen? This is the gospel, man. This is the good news. So I'm gonna gonna jump into some scripture. We're gonna look at Galatians 5 today. This is a powerful chapter. And um, do you know what? I'm just gonna, we're not gonna be here for that long doing this. I'm I'm gonna go through the chapter and just take chunks and just give you what I feel the Lord is speaking to us about around this issue. The devil uses the language of law to distract you from the love of Christ. He wants distance between you and God. And he won't wait for your permission to start doing it. He wants you distant. He wants you to be in a relationship with a God you don't think you can talk to, with a God who you think you offend, with a God who you think is disgusted by who you are. He wants you distant. And as long as he can keep you distant, he'll keep you distracted. And I believe tonight distraction will end. And I believe tonight that distance is going to end and disconnect is going to end because Ephesians 1 says that we are in Christ. It's like putting a piece of paper in this book and closing it. Wherever this book goes, that piece of paper goes. You are in Christ. You can never be separated from him. You're not beside Christ. You're inside Christ and Christ is inside you. The devil's playing games and we need to expose him. Amen. So there's no better way to do that than getting into the word. So book of Galatians chapter five, let's do this. It's all about Jesus, amen? It's all about Jesus. My little sister reminded me of that a few few days ago. Bethany, will you stand up? And Aaron, will you stand up? This is, get up, get up here. This is my little sister and my brother-in-law. Make some noise. And we sat around the other day just drinking a cup of tea, and Bethany just says, it's all about Jesus. And I was like, yeah, it's all about Jesus. And then Ed said something profound, and I thought about changing my whole preach because of it. And then I thought, you know, I'll wait for him to do it. Um, so it's all about Jesus, man. Galatians 5. All right, let's just jump in. Verse 1. Get your Bibles out. Get your phone out. Get your tablet out. You don't need me to read this. You can read it. Get them out. 
a little context to this book. This is one of my favorite books because it deals, Paul is dealing with an issue that I face daily. See, it's post-crucifixion, obviously, and the church is beginning to grow. And there's a group of people, Jews, Messianic Jews, Jews who have received Jesus as their king and as their savior. But what they're doing is they're beginning to teach people in different churches. They're beginning to teach them that they still need to live under the law for justification, to keep a holy and pure life. They still need to keep obeying the law, circumcision and such. They need to keep practicing things to prove themselves to God. And the book of Galatians is basically this huge no that Paul's right in, and Paul is passionate about this. Paul is so passionate about this. Why? Because he knows, he knows the law, man. And he knows what it was about, and he knows it did not save him. It only revealed to him he needed a savior. So Paul's passionate. Paul's feeling like these people are being denied the richness of what it is to follow Jesus. That's the context. He's writing to a group of people who have been taught they have to obey the law that revealed their sin to deal with their sin, and it's not true. So we're going to jump in, chapter 5, verse 1. And if you feel this resonating with you, shout out an amen. Just make some noise because I'm not going to say anything better than what I read out right now. I'm just paraphrasing it. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Verse 2, look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision... I'm going to stop there for a second. I think we all know what circumcision is. And I don't want, I don't want you to become distracted by this, that word in this passage. Circumcision was a real attempt by men to clean themselves, to make themselves pure before God. And it was contextually in place when the law was given, but it no longer is. So when I read circumcision, I don't want you to think about this old thing that was you know, back there in the Mosaic Code, I want you to th replace it with whatever you're dealing with in your mind as your means of making yourself worthy before God. What's the rhetoric in your mind that makes you clean? What's the rhetoric in your mind that you say, if I just do this, then God will love me. If I just say this, then God will love me. If I just become this person one day, then maybe God will love me. Whatever that is, I want you to replace it when I say that word. So look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision... Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. Verse 4, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. You have fallen away from grace. I don't know if you've heard that phrase before. Man, he fell from grace. Man, she fell from grace. Have you heard that before? They fell from grace. Have you heard that before? I've heard that so many times, and I've been digging into it this week, and the week just gone by. I love this book of Galatians. What does that mean, Jesus? What's, what's Paul getting at here? And I felt God started downloading it for me. He was like, to fall from grace is to look at the grace revealed in Christ Jesus, the Son of God who knew no sin, hanging on a Roman torture device with three nine-inch rusty nails pierced through his skin, a crown of thorns, and flesh hanging off his back. He that knew no sin, dying for your sin, grace displayed in that way. Looking at it and saying, that is not enough for my fall. That is not enough for what I've done. I understand that revelation of grace, but it's not enough for my revelation of sin. It's not strong enough. And so that's how I wrote it in my journal. I just wrote, the fall from grace is to say, grace can't handle my fall. Grace isn't strong enough to handle my fall. You fall from grace the moment you believe that grace isn't enough to handle your fall. Everyone in this room has got something in their mind that they don't think Jesus' blood is strong enough to conquer. Whether you do right now or you've done before, I believe it's going to break tonight. Because the blood of Christ covers everything. He that knew no sin, he never knew sin. And he came and lived on this earth in flesh and bones to live out a holy and blameless life. He died our death so we could live his life. There's nothing that you could ever do to prove yourself worthy of God. And yet we still look at the cross and say, man, that's not enough. You don't know what I've done. And so Paul's saying, you're back using circumcision. You're back using performance and independence. Once again, you're trying to do it yourself. And you think you're being self-righteous. 
man, you're, under, you're undermining the walk of Christ. You're undermining the fact the son who was never apart from his father ever chose to be apart from his father so we would never have to be apart from him. He knelt on a garden in soil and sweated blood because he was so anxious of the thought of being separated from the dad he had always known closer than in any of us have ever known another human being that's what he went through and we fall from grace when we look at it and say that's not enough you don't know what I've done you don't know who I am that's it it's real it's not something to glaze over because when I first read it I thought yeah I know that phrase but what does it mean and I'm, I've got a revelation on it now to fall from grace is to say grace can't handle my fall. But you remember what Paul writes in the book of Romans 5. You know how sin entered the whole world through one man's disobedience? Adam, the fall. Well, righteousness entered the world for all men through one man's obedience. So the gospel, the cross goes right back to the beginning. It goes right back to the fall. It goes right back to where it all began when the separation first happened. And it puts it all back together again. Oh, it's good news, amen. It's good news. All right, let's keep going. Whew. Verse 5, for through the Spirit by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. But in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Wow, man, let me spend one minute on this. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. This is Paul giving a knockout punch, a right hook to the idea that the law still counts. Matthew 5, verse 17, Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law. I have come to fulfill it. And this is more powerful than you ever realize, unless you've already realized what I'm about to say. Um, I didn't come to abolish it. I haven't come to rubbish it and pretend it never happened. I've come to fulfill it. So now, every bit of material, every ingredient that was once available for man to use to prove to God that he was worthy of love has been used up. In the, Christ, in the cross of Christ. There's no material left. This is so powerful. Incarnation means word becoming flesh. The word, the law was given to man. The law came in words to man, the Mosaic law. But the word became flesh. Every false image of God was defined and defeated and utterly ended in Jesus. Because when Jesus lived on earth... He showed man everything man was never capable of, but everything God always was. And that's, that's where the power is. When Jesus is on the cross, so is the law. The law was crucified with Christ. All power that the law once had was crucified with Christ. That's why Paul is so confident. Paul's a, he's a scholar of the law. He's so for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, whether you purify by your standards or not, counts for anything but only faith through faith working through love. So really, it's, it's all about giving up, man. It's all about saying, I understand that I can't do this. I understand that my greatest attempt will always fall so short of being enough of your standards, God. And that's the power of looking at a life of Jesus and reading the Gospels because this is a man who lived his whole life with crossing every I of the law and, sorry, dotting every I and crossing every T of the law. And he still died. He did everything right, man. He did everything right and he still died. The wages of sin are death, but Jesus didn't do anything wrong. He didn't do anything wrong. But as he lived out the law, every I dotted and T crossed, he used it all up. Every time he obeyed it in perfection, he used that piece up. That paper got used up. Those words became flesh. It all started getting used up the more and more he lived this blameless life. Are you with me? 
And finally, he dies a death that he shouldn't have died because in him dying, he pays for every single time any man, woman, or child has ever not dotted that I, ever not crossed that T, ever not lived out that law fully. It's just a miracle. It's amazing. Are you with me? Amen. All right. Whew, we're only on verse 5. Okay, verse 7. Let me have some water real quick. Turn to your neighbor and just say, oh, I'm really glad you made it tonight. I'm really glad that you're here. And then just turn to them and say, and this is good news. All right, this is good. All right, verse 7. You are running well. Verse 7, you are running well, Paul says. This is to the people who are now kind of in this juxtaposition. Should we obey the law or not? You are running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? The, this persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that will take no other view. And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision... Why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. The offense of the cross has been removed. The cross is offensive. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves, says Paul. He's getting heavy right now. Verse 13. Can you imagine his blood is boiling? I wish those who were teaching you this would emasculate themselves. Why? For you were called to freedom, brothers. You were called to freedom. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Verse 14, 14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, Watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Oh, this is powerful. You could preach a long time on that, man. Go home this week, open up your Bibles, Galatians 7 through to verse 15, and dig deep. Because I'm not going to cover it all right now. I'm going to go for one aspect of it. Paul's defining the pitfalls of both legalism and license. It's very powerful what he packs in a couple of words. When we fall, as I've been talking about, into the pitfalls of legalism, we fall back into independence and as a wrote distance, distance and separation from God. We fall back into the idea that it's on us. It's on us to prove ourselves worthy of God's love. You'll never be free, my friend. You'll never live a day without anxiety because it's only in the love of God that you stop proving yourself. It's only in the love of God that you stop living like there's something to lose all the time and something to protect all the time. You stop building a reputation when you're convinced of the love of God. And as soon as you fall back into DIY legalism, I'm going to cleanse myself by my standards, you will end up there. And this is why it's important. It's why I'm going to preach it for the rest of my life. Because you'll miss out on the whole point. You'll miss out on everything that Jesus paid for, for you to know the love of God, that he loves you without condition and without reservation and as you are and not as you should be. So Paul's like, don't fall into legalism because you miss, you miss it all. But also, don't fall into license. And what is license? License is because of grace, I, ha I now have a license to sin. The idea is this. The premise is this. I wrote it down so I would say it right. If justification is on the basis of Christ's righteousness received through, by grace, sorry, through faith... If justification is on the basis of Christ's righteousness received by faith through grace, then perhaps it makes sense for me to keep sinning. Because the more I sin, the more grace I get. That might sound crazy to you, but like I said last week, there's a whole portion of church history where people devoted themselves to this idea, one man in particular. And if you think that's mad and you like unheard of, it, it won't be long till you hear someone talking like it because I hear people talking about it all the time. And Paul is saying, no, 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 no. And you know how that was wordy what I said? If justification is on the basis of Christ's righteousness by grace through faith, that's pretty theological, right? Paul, that's Paul 
his response is not so profound theologically. He just says, no, 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 no. That doesn't work. Why? It can't. Why? Because how are you who are dead to sin still living it? To put it bluntly, dead people can't sin. You can't sin if you're dead. You can't do it. You don't have it in your capacity to sin if you're dead. There isn't this theological rebuttal to it apart from that. You are dead. The part of you that was in sin is now dead. Before they went down into the waters, I said to each person, whatever you know is in you which isn't in Christ, we're leaving that in the water. We're leaving that in the water. And you can choose to do that time and time again. I left you in the water. I left you in the water. But Paul's, Paul's passionate about this because if you live like that with this idea that sinning is a part of your nature, you're missing the whole point of the cross. You have a new nature now. You are a new creation. You are a new person. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's no longer I who live, that old self, but Christ who lives in me, the life I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. Amen. Oh, man, I'm holding on to these words every single day of my life. From now I'm 26 to when I'm 106. This is all that's getting me through. This is all that's given me the life I dreamt of. This is, all, what, this is what it's all about. And I wrote this little phrase for myself, which was, um, where you sow, Josh, there you grow. Where you sow, there you grow. Whatever we sow into produces something. And I had this image of, you know what, like, Christ paid for me to live a life of freedom. And to produce fruit of freedom in my life, man, I want to be a man that just produces the fruit of freedom. Not competition. Not anxiety, no fear, not envy, not lust, man, not perversion, not poverty, but freedom. Thinking the best of each other, thinking the best of myself, not because of self-confidence, but because I believe who Jesus says I am. I want to produce that fruit, so i got to start sowing those seeds, and that means spending time believing I am a son, man. I am a saint. Jesus paid it all, Christ, in me the hope of glory. I'm producing fruit of freedom that people are getting to see and witness and eat from. My capacity is growing, amen? But Paul's talking about how we can also sow seeds of death. Every time that you start thinking that sinning is a part of who you are, contradicting the word of God and the cross, you start sowing death. You start attaching it to part of yourself. I had this image of... I'm, be serious now. We're, we're in fr friendship. We're in community with each other. So actually, you come into contact with one another when there's confessions being made. Or you come into contact with one another when you hear someone talking about what they've done and you know it's not who they are. We talk about this every week. But God showed me this image of me like walking into a graveyard and finding one of my brothers or sisters with a shovel digging up a corpse. Getting in there, digging up this corpse in like the middle of the night. And I was like, what is that? And I felt God say, that's what happens every time one of you starts sinning. And our response should be repulse. We should be repulsed. Not, at, not, be, not of who they are, not of who they are, but of the fact that somehow the enemy has got them thinking that what Jesus paid for wasn't enough. So we need to go up to one another and pull the shovel out of each other's hands and say, that isn't who you are, man. That isn't who you are. I, I would love it if this time... Next year, this is this constant conversation because we've been so on it for so long about who you are and whose you are. That our response to sin isn't, man, how are you going to deal with that struggle? It's, oh, man, you forgot who you are. Let me remind you. Amen. And I give you permission, all of you, to do it for me. We're just brothers and sisters. I need it. We all need it. Remind me of who I am and I'll remind you of who I am. And that's what Paul's doing to the Galatians. He's reminding them. It's powerful. Where you show there you grow. Jesus died your death so you could live his life. That's good news. Life of miracles and life of abundance. Life of parisos. A life that goes beyond what you expect and, and goes beyond what you anticipated. Amen. Verse 16. We're nearly there, guys. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. To keep you from doing the things you want to do, verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Walking, walking by the Spirit is living out Galatians 2.20. 
and you can do this every day and remind yourself today it's no longer you pray this with me if you want right now if you want to lift your hand you can do that if you want to receive this i'm receiving it right now it is no longer i who live but it's christ who lives in me the life that i live in the flesh i live by faith in the son of god who loves me and gave himself for me when we live by the spirit we live with this assured belief that it's christ in us and his righteousness it's Dad, Abba, Father, our God who loves us. And that seal of love is the approval we've always wanted. It's the belonging we've always craved for. And the Holy Spirit, our comfort and our counselor, is leading us day by day into a life of adventure and abundance that we could never have constructed on our own. That's what it is. And if you need to remind yourself of that, speak the word over yourself. Remind your flesh that it's dead and your spirit, it's, he's alive. Amen. Oh, Galatians 2.20, I love that verse. Verse 19. Now, I've switched up here. Are you guys still with me? I know we're going a little longer tonight because we had a lot more stuff going on, but I, I didn't want to just cut the word short. I wanted to bring it home. So are you still with me? All right, okay, verse 19. Now, I've switched up. I've, I'm reading verse 19 to 21 from the message, not because the ESV falls short. It doesn't. You can read it in the ESV. It's the same thing. I just like the descriptive language that Eugene Peterson uh, uses here. All right. Now, as I read this, I'm going to be listing off a lot of things that Paul is calling out in people as a result of that life of independence, manifestations of that life of independence. And if you relate to something that I read out like I did when I read it for myself, you don't need to put your hand up. You don't need to do anything. We're not exposing you here. But I want you to know it. I want you to know it that, yeah, man, that's in my life right now. I'm doing that. Like, that's there. Because I believe you're going to get set free from it. So I want to take a moment as I read this, just hold it. Paul says, look, it's obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. And a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied once, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or an impotence to be loved, divided homes, and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community, <sighs> ugly parodies of community. And Paul says, I could go on. And I know that there's people in the room who are relating to one of those things, and I know you do because I do. And this isn't to expose you, this is to expose the devil. <laughs> because the devil wants to keep you silent, man. Remember how I spoke about in the beginning, the devil wants distance. The devil wants distance between you and God. And he wants distance between you and community. And so the devil has been telling you for so long, whatever that thing is, keep silent. And so I want to take a moment tonight. I know I can't look at you all individually in your eyes, but I want to look at you as if I can and say this with real honest conviction that whatever you're going through right now, whatever it is that you related to when I read that, your struggle is not a taboo. Your struggle, whatever it is that you feel, whatever fall you feel grace can't handle is not a taboo. It's not a taboo. I don't care if you've heard that in church before. I don't know if you've heard it preached that this shouldn't be talked about. But here, I'm drawing a line in the sand and I'm saying we're going to break some silence. Do the science. The devil's a liar. He moves in silence. But when we start speaking and his knees start weakening because life and death is in the power of the tongue. And when we speak it out, we expose him, man. We exp I don't care if it's 
addiction. I don't care if it's sexual. I don't care if it's financial. I don't care what it is, whether it's depression or anxiety, same-sex attraction. I don't care. I don't care what it is. It doesn't matter. We're putting a level playing field in the room right now. We're saying together as a community, Jesus is enough. His blood covers every transgression. He is enough. It's not a taboo for you because it wasn't a taboo for him. He that knew no sin did what? Became your sin so that you could become the righteousness of God. As long as you stay silent about it, you're putting a bullseye on your chest. That which isn't crucified will be targeted. But tonight, we're going to crucify ourselves with Christ. You can do that again. Are you with me tonight? And I'm not talking about you now waiting for the next Christian leader to have your ear, the next priest to speak to, the next pastor to grab for 10 minutes just to tell, you, to tell them something. That's not what I'm talking about. That's been too long in the church where we've lived like there's a mediator between us and Christ. Now, what I want to see in our community is that firstly, our confession is boldly at the, th at the throne of God and at the cross of Christ, saying without any fear, I believe that cross is enough for this Jesus. I've decided to tap you into the ring. Come on in. I'm so afraid. I feel so alone. But in you, I know I'm free. Brothers, it's for freedom that Christ died. It's for freedom that Christ set you free. Amen? Amen. Come on. And then we have a community. So you can tell someone. And it doesn't have to be an expert because there's no experts in the room. There's no experts in this. We're all learning. We're all becoming. We're all becoming. So let it be someone you trust. And just go to them and say, man, you know what? I need to tell someone. I need to tell someone. Why? I want to expose the devil, man. He's been keeping me silent for too long. This is happening in my life. Will you pray for me? Because there's nothing better than they can, that they can do than that, I promise you. Yeah, let me pray for you. I don't understand what it is. I'm not going to try to understand what it is. I've never been through it myself, but I'm going to start reminding you about who you are and whose you are. You are not your sin. You, it isn't you. It doesn't belong to you anymore. That's a dead man. He doesn't exist anymore. I don't care what it is. I've, I've sat with too many people, too many people who have said something to me and they put it into the light. Because Ephesians says, put it into the light and destroy the enemy's foothold. Put it into the light. And when they put it into the light, and I've said, how long has this been going on? And they've said, my whole life. And I said, why don't you tell anyone? And they said, well, I just, I didn't think that I could. I, I didn't think I was allowed. Or some people say, I heard it said in church that this shouldn't be talked about. And that's true. And there's people in the room who've had the upbringing. So tonight... And I know I'm going on a little bit, and we don't usually go on this long, but it's important that we do tonight. I really feel it. You're, whatever it is, it's not a taboo. Amen? Amen. Whew. <laughs> Come on. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Jesus is enough. Are you ready to find out what you've been saved for? All right, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. This is the fruit of freedom. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is. If you really, oh, here we go. Verse 22. It's going to jump back in there. Uh, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, life. I love how Eugene put, Peason put, as it, puts it. Exuberance about life and serenity. Whew. Love, joy, life, patience, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things, there is no law. I'm going to read them again and receive it for yourself. And if you want to get Pentecostal about it, you can stand up because it's just bubbling up in you and just receive it. This is what you've been saved for. This is who you are. This is your life. Ready? Love, joy, serenity, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
Oh, against these things, there is no law. When you start moving in these things, the devil realizes how far he is from catching you. Oh, man, this is the good news. This is the verse 24. And those who belong, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passion. Crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. It's too much. You don't know what it's like when I'm in that moment and it's all that I want to do and I'm consumed by it. There's no way out, man. You don't know what it's like when it's all over me and it's consuming me and it's too much. And Paul says, hold up, hold up. Jesus Christ has crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. I know what it's like to struggle, man. I know what it's like to feel like it's too much, that it's burning in you, that there's no way out. But I don't believe it anymore. I believe Jesus is enough. I believe that Jesus is enough. Don't care what it is. Don't care if it's anxiety. Don't care if it's gambling. Don't care if it's porn addiction. I don't care what it is. Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. And sometimes you need to remind the devil of that. No, Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. Say it until your flesh reminds it that it's crucified. Can I keep going a little longer? Real quick. Real quick. I remember a time in my life, let me roll on this video, a time in my life. This is before Cara and I were married. And I was, I was journeying with my brothers through dealing with lust. And I remember a time where I was struggling, man. I was struggling. And I was in that place where I felt consumed. And I remember I was in my room feeling consumed. And I said, God, I don't know what to do. I know I want to do the things I don't want to do. What shall I do? And you know what I heard him say? Run. I said, what? Run. Run, Josh. Run. You remember that scene in Lord of the Rings when Gandalf is hanging from that uh, cliff and there's that big demon coming up and, the, and the, the, the hobbits are standing there looking at him and he looks back at them and he just says, fly you fools, run. And I started running and I ran out of the house and I ran to some fields and man, I kept running and I just kept running and I kept running and I kept saying, Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough until my flesh believed it, man. See, in the book of Proverbs, we get told, don't even go down to the street where the prostitute lives. Because once you're on the street, man, you've already given yourself over. Don't even go down to the street where she lives. And I'm not talking about purely sexual stuff right here. And this is a message that is being preached outside of the church. I don't know if you're aware of that. This isn't just the church preaching this message against lust and against porn. Because it's disabling healthy relationships and it's disabling healthy people. We need to run sometimes, amen? Allow yourself to hear that. Allow, you, allow yourself to hear the Lord say, fly, you fool. <laughs> run. Run until your flesh believes it. All right, I'm nearly there. I'm nearly there. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Verse 25. This is the end. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not come conceited provoking one, uh, one another, envying one another for those who belong to Christ. And this is the end. If you belong to Christ, if you, choose, if you truly feel, I can see you better now, if you truly believe that you belong to Christ Jesus, if you truly believe that you belong to him, you don't belong to desire, you don't belong to who you used to be, you don't belong to what someone once said about you, if you belong to Christ, you will start believing it as well. You will start believing what I've preached tonight is true. I'm not trying to say that you all need to walk out of here believing it all of a sudden. My message is this. Accept the fact you belong to him now. You don't belong to sin. You don't belong to death. You belong to Christ Jesus. And you're going to start believing it, I promise you. And when you start believing it, you're going to start behaving it. It's this full transformation, man. Utterly transformed. Utterly transformed. Amen? Whew. All right. One more, one more little bit. 
Okay. John 14, I'm going to end with this. John 14, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. And I want to bring this full circle now. If you love me, you'll obey me. Jesus doesn't want us to do anything out of law. He wants us to do everything out of love. There's nothing I've said tonight which is to push you back into law, to push you back into performance. We don't seek to fulfill a law anymore. We seek to express love for Jesus because we're so acutely aware of what he's done for us. Amen. Come on. Amen. Can we just stand together? We're, do you know what? We're going to end the night here, man. We're going to stand together, and I'm going to pray over you guys. I just, um, can, we, can we raise the lights a little bit? I'm going to pray over you all right now, and then Sam's going to put some music on. We have a soft ending here. It's nothing dramatic. If you need to go, you can go. It's half past eight. The story continues. We don't live for Sunday nights, man. We don't live for these nights. We just live in life, and we come here on a Sunday to get reset a little bit sometimes, refocus a little bit sometimes, but life continues tomorrow. So will you just do whatever feels most radical to you, whether it's putting your hand on your heart, whether it's putting your hand in the air, whether it's putting your hand on the person next to you because you just want to do this in community right now. Do it. Come on. Get brave. This is true. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Jesus, we just choose to believe tonight that you are enough. We draw the line in the sand. Jesus, you are enough. Whatever we're walking through, whether it's personal, whether it's in our family, whether it's in our community, whether it feels like it's too late, whether it feels like death is already here, and we're at the footsteps of the grave just like Lazarus. We look into the tomb right now and we say, Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. There's a resurrection in the name of Jesus. There's abundance in the name of Jesus. I want to encourage you, if tonight you've never met Jesus, you've never prayed to Jesus, you don't really know who he is, on the count of three, I'm going to get everyone in this room just to say, Jesus is enough over our situations, and I dare you to say it with us. Paul talks about, um, like, uh, uh, cheap magic religion. We're not into that. We're not into that. We're into relationship here. We're all about a relationship with a father who will never leave you, with a savior who covers your blind spots, and with a Holy Spirit who will comfort and counsel you. So I just encourage you to say it. Jesus is enough, whatever it is. And we're going to pick off where we left off next week. Ready? One, two, three. Jesus is enough. Hallelujah. Make some noise for the king. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Bless you guys. We're going we're gonna to be here same time next week and the week after and the week after.